Good morning. It's good to see you. Stand if you would and let's sing He is able to deliver thee. your first time to be here at Central Baptist Church in Thornton. We are glad to have you this morning. Glad you chose to worship with us and trust that God would speak to you and I this morning. Amen. He keeps me singing. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken streams, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me Far beyond the starry sky I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown I shall reign with him on high Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know Feels my In your announcements this morning, you'll notice that we have a budget committee meeting at 5 p.m. We are just one month away from starting our new fiscal year, so we need to be working on our budget today. Hope you will show up for that. 5.30 p.m. missions committee meeting. Um, we need to be praying about what we're going to do to support Ben and Savannah Maxie. And also 6 o'clock. We have our ice cream fellowship, social. Uh, now, one thing I'm going to ask you to do for this ice cream social, with COVID, we never have not resumed Sunday evening services. But at this social, we want to kind of take up the one-on-one uh, -on -one project, and that is where you select one person that God seeks you after so that you might win them to the Lord or that you might influence them so that they'll become servants of God. So we want you to come up with one person. 
you won't have to give me that name, but I would ask you to write it down uh, and start documenting how many times a month you interact with that person, what you're doing in order that you might uh, influence them for God. But one-on-one, -on -one, so you pray about it today. Who's, who's going to be your one? Who's going to be your one that God's going to put you on in order that you might influence them for the kingdom of God? Uh, and then we'll enjoy the, the ice cream. Uh, I still like I, I still like vanilla. <laughs> Any other announcements we need to make today? Do ask you to remember Ms. Bobby Reynolds in your prayers. She's still in the LMC, uh, so you remember to pray for her. She's a so social butterfly that is not getting ministered to because we can't go in and see her. Uh, so you pray for her well-being. Any others? Hello, Ms. Ann Brown. How are you today? <laughs> Any other announcements? It's good to see each one of you. God bless you for choosing to worship with us today. Bow for a word of prayer, if you would. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your kindness to us, your mercies. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the forgiveness that we have in him. We thank you for eternal life, Father, and all that it encompasses. We thank you, God, that you are giving us the opportunity to worship you and to uh, raise our hands to glorify you today. I ask that you might anoint Brother Brandon that as he preaches your word, that uh, you'll give him the power and the peace that he needs to speak exactly what you have him say in order that Jesus might be glorified. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Brother Mike. A bunch of kiddos. I need some grown-ups to come up. <laughs> I should have some kids. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are we doing? Good morning, All right. Who wants to be my official towel person? That's an important job. Can you handle it? All righty. Guys, look here. Let me see. Let me get a little organized. I know you people at the back probably can't see everything I got. Uh-oh. I got it. Okay, thank you, young man. Hope that didn't mess up my experiment. <laughs> All right. I got an orange soda. Yummy. Yummy. Uh, a &W cream soda. Not yummy. A lot of people say yummy. Dr. Pepper. Who's my Dr. Pepper people? Oh, okay. There they are. And a Coke. Yay. Okay. All right. And over here, I got a pitcher of water. Willie says, okay. He, Willie works outside. And outside. Now, y'all know these are all 12-ounce cans. You may not know that, but they are. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these sodas. Can you move just a little bit? And I'm going to put it over here in this water. And what I want y'all to do is I want you to tell me if you think this can is going to float on top of the water or if it's going to sink. I thought, I thought, you, were, I thought you were going to pour it in. Oh, you thought I was going to pour it in there? All right. No, we can't waste good soda water. All right. Float, float or sink? How many think it's going to float? All right, about four. And how many think it's going to sink? All right, let's try it and see, okay? All right, here we go. And it goes. I believe that sunk, don't you? All right, so let's get this one out. You're going to dry it off for me. Okay, and you got a bunch of them to dry. All right, so next one is going to be a and W cream soda. You said, oh, you didn't like this one, right? Sink or float? Float. Just good? Okay. All right. Here we go. And it goes. Whoop. What'd it do? Sink. Is that a word, sink? Yeah. All right. Got another one to draw. All right. Here we go, miss. Dr. Pepper. Sink or float? Sink. Sink. Okay. 
She says sink. Got air underneath it. Because she said it had air underneath. Uh oh. Uh oh. You got it. What'd it do? Sunk. All right. So we got three that's already sank and we got one left. So guess what this is going to do? Float? We already got three that sunk. All of them going to sink. So why would we think this is going to be different? Uh oh. It's floating, isn't it? You told me. <laughs> Woo. All right, now, here's the deal. What kind of lesson can we learn from this? Okay, let's try to figure out some lesson that's based on scripture, okay? Now, Brother Tracy, last week he began his sermon by saying, on such and such date I preached this once before. And I've done this once before, but I don't remember the date. But God gave me a different vision based on the scriptures and the lessons I've heard preached over the last several weeks. But he wanted me to go about this a different way, okay? All right. So all these cans are 12-ounce cans. They all have soda water in them, right? And they're different kinds. And they're kind of like people out there. See, all of us out here are people, aren't we? Aren't we? Some of us have a tie on. Maybe somebody doesn't have a tie on, okay? Maybe this is somebody's first time in church. Maybe this is somebody's come to church all the time. But we can't tell anything about these people unless the Holy Spirit helps us. Now, the water told us there was a difference between these soda waters, didn't it? Three of them sank and one floated. The water told us a different story, right? That there's a difference inside the can. They match. Okay, there's a difference inside the can, right? If there's not a difference inside the can, then why did three sink and one float? Because there's a difference inside. The Holy Spirit tells us when our inside is not matching our outside. Okay? We say one thing, but our inside says something different. And that's the Holy Spirit revealing to us what we call sin. See, we have a sin nature, and the Holy Spirit tells us. Now, three of these cans sink. When we have sin in our lives, that's what happens to us. We're not able to do the things that God wants us to do because we sink. We sink into sin. But when God tells us through the Holy Spirit that we need to be lifted up. We need to float. We need to be positive for Jesus Christ. We need to tell people about Jesus Christ. I didn't get all that, but I know it's had to be important. <laughs> Something about Popo. So that's good. Anytime you talk about Popo, it's good. Okay? So do y'all understand that concept? Okay, the Holy Spirit tells us which one is going to float? Which one of us is up here floating, doing what God wants us to do, listening to his will in our lives? And he's going to tell us also when we are loaded with what? What are we loaded with? Sin. Sin. And what does sin make us do? It makes us sink, doesn't it? And we're not able to do the things that we need to do. Yeah. Okay. So y'all got that? Everybody get that? Yeah. I'll take care of it, okay? Y'all been great listeners. I was worried about if we were going to have enough kiddos. And look here, how many we got up here? Where are y'all hiding? I couldn't see y'all a while ago. You get a tattoo? All right. Okay. Brother Tracy, you got candy for these guys? Okay, let, let's, let's pray. Let's pray, guys. Lord, we do thank you for our time with our children. And, Lord, I ask that you bless their lives. And, Lord, 
as you reveal to them, reveal to us also the condition of our inside, okay? Whether we have sin that's holding us back, that's causing us to sink, or whether or not we listen to the Holy Spirit to get our lives right with Jesus Christ. Forgive us now where we have failed you and be merciful to us and bless these children, Lord, and keep us all free from the coronavirus. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all go see Brother Tracy and be sure and tell him thank you. Before we sing this song, you know, I don't know why this comes to my mind from time to time, but every once in a while we'll sing a song that I would say has a little bit of drive to it. And it makes me wonder, when David danced before the Lord, he had no shame. He, had, he could care less who was standing around. He could care less who was seeing, who was watching. He was worshiping God. He was singing and dancing before God. And I wonder sometimes, when's the last time we've gotten happy enough that we just didn't care who was around us, what was going on around us? We were worshiping our Heavenly Father, and He's the only one we cared about. And so from time to time, we'll sing a song that has a little bit of drive to it. I go, you know what? Sometimes somebody's going to cut loose and go, you know what? I don't care who's looking. I'm worshiping God this morning, and I'm praising Him. Let it look like what it wants to look like. Amen. <laughs> Stand if you will. Let's sing when death was arrested. Alone in my sorrow, dead in my sin Lost without hope, ways to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested, my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained My orphan heart was given my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life For oh, your grace, so oh, free, washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your
are God's children, and we are here to praise him this morning. Amen. is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King. Master, Shepherd. 
worship your name this morning. Lord, as Brother Brandon comes to preach, Lord, would you just speak to him and speak through him. And Lord, may we have hearts and, hearts and ears to hear this morning from him as he will, we pray. Be possessed. Children, that way. <laughs> All right, good morning. morning. How's everybody doing this morning? All right, so stay right here. Okay. All right. I I want to apologize. I'm just so scared. I have so much to say, and so I apologize, and I feel for y'all on days when I'm like this. All right. I just uh, this sermon has just been sitting on my heart all week, and I just have so many just different things that I want to say, want to uh, get through. Um, and so let's uh, before we even get started, let's let's do this. Let's let's uh, calm ourselves, and I'm mainly talking to myself, and let's let's pray. All right. Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for all the ways that you love us, all the ways that you bless us, Lord. Father, I pray today uh, that you would speak through me and to me, Lord, that it would be your words that are spoken today, not mine, Lord, that there is nothing of mine to gain but just you put on display, Lord. And Father, I pray um, that as we talk about facing opposition, that as we talk about spiritual battles, Lord, that we would leave out of here ready to go, ready to fight, uh, from victory, Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. And so uh, today I want to talk about uh, uh, spiritual warfare almost and, and uh, battling spiritually. Um, before we get there, though, I want, to, I want to frame this sermon in a lens that I think is going to lead us the rest of the way. I, I've told y'all before, uh, if I listen to music, I'm most likely listening to Christian rap, all right? Christian rap, okay? Um, I'm most likely listening to Christian rap. And there's a song out, and I highly recommend everybody uh, go listen to this song. It's, the song is called Armies, and it's by my favorite artist right now. It's an artist named KB, all right? And in this song, he starts off, starts off this song with the lyrics, and I've loved this, and it's just kind of been one of my anthems. Uh, he starts off the, the song by saying this, that life hasn't been the same since death died that Jesus won by a landslide. And so that's just been something that has just been on my heart, is that lyric. And so when we talk about spiritual warfare today, I want to frame it through the lens that we are not fighting for victory, but we are fighting from victory. That the battle has already, already been won through Jesus. That we are fighting from victory as, as believers in Jesus Christ. And so we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. And the victory that Jesus Christ has already won on the cross when he defeated sin, hath de sin, death, hell, and the grave. So I want to frame it through those lens today. I usually say stuff for like that like at the end, and like really try to drive that home at the end. I just wanted to start with that because that's the best news, right? So I want, let, let's start with that today and let's, um, let's go here now. I want to um, use an example real quick. Does anybody, and we all have them. I think most of us have these. If you are watching TV and you're just flipping through channels, a lot of us, we've had a lot of time to watch TV, right? And so if you're watching TV and you're just flipping through channels, is there a movie that if you see it on, you're just like, clear my schedule, I'm watching this. I don't care what I have to do right now, it can wait, I'm watching this movie. Do you all have a movie like that? All right, I want to hear some. Like, what are they? You can tell me. We can, we can have this interaction, this conversation. What are they? McClintock, I saw that movie. Oh my gosh, okay. That's the only John Wayne movie I've ever seen. I, I saw that movie, all right? I've got, I've got one in me, all right? I can't believe that's the movie. Okay, anyways, all right. Sorry, sorry. All right, that movie is sitting in my DVD collection right now. Oh my gosh. All right, what else? Somebody give me another one. Still Magnolias. Okay, never seen that, but I've heard of it, all right? What'd you say? Secondhand, that is a, I've seen that movie. That is a great movie. I like that movie. All right. What else? Some other movies. Wizard of Oz. Okay. Um, old school. I like it. All right. What else? A few more. The Alamo. Okay. New or old? Old probably. Okay. All right. I've seen the, new, the newest one. All right. 
The shootest? Okay. All right. Since in a theme, almost. Okay. John Wayne. Okay. All right. I should have guessed that. All right. What was that right here? Tombstone. Okay. All right. We have a Western crowd. All right. I need to. If you're going to believe it or not, the movie that I'm going to name is not a Western. Okay. I know. Shocker. All right, but there's a movie that if I see it on, no matter what, I am pausing my day and I am watching this movie. All right, I own the DVD, but I, I love to watch it on TV. And the movie that I, lo I love to watch when I see it on um, is a movie called, what? Mrs. Doubtfire. Not Mrs. Doubtfire, if you can. <laughs> wow. Okay. We are off the rails this morning. I love it. All right. The movie that I, I love to see on is a movie called Pacific Rim. All right. Does anybody, have, has anybody seen that movie, Pacific Rim? Okay, all right, a few of y'all, okay. If you haven't, this movie is fantastic, all right? This movie features giant robots against giant aliens. I mean, what, what more can you want in a movie? I know John Wayne isn't in it, but th this movie is fantastic, all right? And so uh, this movie features these, these giant, just like monster creatures, and they come up from this breach in the Pacific Ocean. And so they come up from this breach, and so uh, ma humanity kind of bonds together, puts all differences aside, and they build these like giant robots operated by these two pilots to fight these giant creatures. Just brilliant writing, right? And so this movie is awesome. And so what, what, what they, they start killing these giant creatures, and every so now another one will pop up and, and come, and so they kill that, another one will pop up. Uh, the attacks start to get bigger and bigger and more and more and more. And so they finally decide we have to get to the breach. We have to stop the breach. Because if we stop the breach, there we will stop the, the attacks, right? Now, why tell you that? Because this morning, I want to talk about the attacks that Satan brings. I want to talk about getting to the root, to the breach of these attacks. All right, it's where I want to go this morning. Because we're all honest, 2020 has been an interesting year. Right, and we see that just stuff has come at one after another, right, between coronavirus, riots, things shutting down, murder hornets, just everything has kind of come at us, and, and it feels like just it's not going to stop. And then, maybe for some of us, in this time period, it has felt like, Almost that breach has been opened in our lives, and just Satan has used this breach in this time period to attack us in so many different ways. That he has reached and he has started to attack. And last time I preached, um, I mentioned that I said, I don't want us to make the mistake of just thinking that because things are bad, that God is not moving during this time. That God is doing something amazing in the midst of all that is going on, because God is amazing, and when he moves, it's amazing. And so God is doing something in the midst of this. And so I don't want us to just sit around waiting for this all to end and missing out on what God is doing in the midst of it. All right? And so what I think, and what is something, me and Brother Tracy talked about it briefly this morning, is that the, the good that has come from this. And being able to talk to some of y'all and just um, hearing that you're like, okay, I've used this time to get closer to my family. I've used this time to get closer to God. I had a student uh, messaged me the other day, and it just like, oh, it just pumped me up. Like, I want to work out. But she messaged me, and she asked just a simple question, like, I want to start reading my Bible, but I don't know where to start. I was like, okay, like, let's go. Like, we can work with that. That's a question a youth minister loves to get, right? Like, let's talk about that. And so me and Bishop, like, sent her this instructional video, right, on how, how to read your Bible. Um, and so, but the thing is, and where, where we're going to go this morning is I want to give a difficult truth about when we begin to get closer to God. Um, one of the things I love about this church and I've always loved about it is Brother Tracy don't ever sugarcoat anything when he preaches. And I love that fact. And I've heard somebody say before that the gospel doesn't need sugar, it's sweet enough. And so what I want to do is not sugarcoat anything this morning, but I want to tell you a very difficult truth and it's simply this is that with great spiritual res restoration or great spiritual renew, there comes great spiritual opposition. That the closer you get to God, that the more opposition you're going to face. All right, I want to illustrate it uh, like this. Brother Shannon, come here. All right, and Brother Richie, come here. 
I always like using Richie, because he, he gives me that face every time. <laughs> All right, so I want to illustrate it, illustrate it like this real quick. I have a football right here. Um, I was going to bring mine, but I got it, so I found this one in the back. Um, this is our running back right here. That's a linebacker. All right, let's say I'm the quarterback, all right? And so we got Dak and Zeke right here, right? And so, all right, we don't know. Oh, okay, all right. And so I'm going, if I say hut and I hand the ball off, what are you going to do? I'm going to run that way. You're going to run that way? Okay. All right, that's cool. You didn't, like, go that way. You're just, like, I'm running that way. No, you can, you can't. It's fine. Okay, all right. What are you going to do? Tackle him, all right? What of us? Why? Yes, why? He's got the ball. Okay. Why are you not coming after me? I don't have the ball. All right, thank you. I'm not a threat anymore. Okay, thank you. All right. Yes, all right. You can give these guys a hand. All right. I'm not a threat anymore, but he is because he's advancing. And so the more you advance, the more opposition that you're going to face. All right, the more of the gospel that you are trying to advance, the more opposition that you're going to face. If you're not facing opposition, maybe you're not advancing the gospel. And it's something that you really need to think about. So what I want to look at today is how we face and how we deal with that opposition. All right, to do that, I want to go to the book of Nehemiah. All right, Nehemiah chapter 4, just real quick. Love, love the book of Nehemiah. I think we as a youth group are going to go through it in, in the fall. Love the book of Nehemiah. Um, Give you just a little background on, on what's happening here. Um, God's people have returned to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in ruins. All right, and they begin the restoration of the temple. Word gets back to Nehemiah, who's a Hebrew living in Persia, that uh, they're rebuilding the temple. And he realizes that while they're rebuilding the temple, that the walls are also destructed. And if your walls are destructed, that you are very open to attack. So he comes back. He leads the rebuilding of the walls. All right, and so he rallies God's people to uh, spread out and let's rebuild the walls together. Now, this passage beginning in Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1 is called opposition to the work. Then as they start doing God's work, they're going to face opposition. And so a, a leader named Sambalot is going to come and he's going to oppose them. All right, and so what I want to look at this morning is the, through the lens of that when we advance God's work, we face opposition. And how we deal with that. All right, so Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now when Sambalot heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, And he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers in the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, Yeah, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. All right, I don't know if you caught that, but that is some serious ancient eastern trash talk going on in, in this passage. All right? And so this man named Sambalot, this leader, comes up, to, comes up to them as they're rebuilding the wall. All right, and he begins to oppose them, and he begins to say things like, um, he calls them feeble. All right? Not a compliment. Calls them feeble. All right, and then this other guy um, comes up and says, yeah, if a fox jumps up on your walls, it's going to fall down. I don't know if y'all have ever seen a fox, very small, lightweight animal. All right, for just, and so they begin to discourage them in the midst of rebuilding this walls. All right, and so that's kind of the first point I want to make and want to look at today is we will face attacks in the form of discouragement. All right, that the enemy will begin to discourage us. And some of y'all have felt this and you felt it hard in your lives. That God will lay on your heart things to do, like you start praying more. All right? Start, start to pray more, and the thoughts will pop into your head. What are you doing? You don't know what to say. You're going to pray to God, really? You know what you did yesterday? And so those thoughts will begin to pop into your mind as you begin to getting ready to pray, that you will feel those discouraging, act, or discouraging thoughts. Or maybe you'll get the idea, I'm, I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to get into God's word daily. And the thought will enter your head. You don't know where to start. You're not going to understand it even if you read it. What are you doing? So those thoughts will begin to enter your mind. 
and you'll be dealing with that discouragement. Maybe it's just even coming to church. You'll feel those discouraging thoughts. What are you doing here? You don't belong here. You're just a sinner. You can't be around all those people. Let me quickly dispel all three of those. God loves talking to you, no matter where you're at. You don't have to have perfect words to say. He just wants to talk to you. All right? You can understand your Bible. All right? If you're feeling that, you can. All right? Message me. I would love to talk to you about reading the Bible. All right? And if you feel like you don't belong here, that you're just a sinner, welcome. We all are. All right? Glad to have you. But you'll feel those discouraging thoughts start to come in when you begin to get closer to God. I've had so many people, um, and they, they've come to me with different things, and I've, I've said this to them each time, and it kind of catches people off guard. Uh, somebody will come up to me with something that God has really laid on their heart. They're like, I want to do this. I think this would be really cool, or I want to see this done. I think this would be really cool. Uh, and then, so they'll ask, like, what do you think about it? Do you think you want to do something like that? And I'll say this to them. That sounds great. You do it. That God has put that on your heart, you do it. And I get almost 99% of the time I'll hear this response, I can't do something like that. And immediately that discouragement will begin to slip in. So let me just, God's work is not for ministers, God's work is for God's people. And if you think that you can't do something that God has called you to do, you're in a great spot because God loves people who are dependent upon him for him to get his work done. But this discouragement that starts coming in, that starts seeping in, how do we deal with it? And I, lo I love how like Nehemiah responds right here. Um, he goes on, uh, verse 4. It says, Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunts on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt, and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to the anger in the presence of the builders. Verse 6, love this. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to, its half, to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. First thing you do when you start feeling that discouragement, you start feeling those attacks, you pray. That's going to be a common theme. You pray, and you persevere. You keep going. You pray, and you keep going. All right? Love that Nehemiah doesn't give it the time of day. He just keeps going and they keep rebuilding the wall. The great theologian Rocky said that winning is not about how hard you can hit, but how hard you can get hit and keep going. And the Christian walk is no different. It's about how hard you can get hit and you just keep going. You keep pressing on. You keep going. Whatever God's called you to do. Let me say this real quick in this. Satan doesn't mind spiritual spikes. Let me, let me address that real quick, spiritual spikes. That if you get really excited about God and then you fade and you get really excited about God and fade, you know what? Satan can't stand spiritual consistency. There's somebody who's daily on their knees before God praying in his word, keeping going no matter what. So you be persistent in your following of God and you persevere no matter what's going on. No matter the discouragement, I um, was up here uh, with Bishop uh, one day this week. Bishop is my, my one and a half year old hurricane, as I, as I call him. And um, does anybody, most, some of y'all may know this, does anybody know Bishop's favorite room in the entire church? It's not the nursery. It's not the kitchen. No, it's not the kitchen. He does love to eat, but it's not the kitchen. All right. Um, it is the, what'd you say? It is right next to it. It's the closet back there. The clo because the balls are in there, all right? And he knows that, and he's figured that out. And so if you see him, or if, you, if you're for some reason watching him and lose sight of him, he's in that room, all right? And so that, that's where he is. Uh, and there is, you know, 30 different kinds of balls in there. That's where I got this one. And so he loves it in there. All right, he'll come up here and he'll take every single one of them out. If I ever, I apologize if y'all come up here in that room's in a mess. It's our fault. I, I try to clean it up. Uh, but he loves that room. And so he was going up there, or he was heading towards that room when we were up here. And so I'd already been in there for something. I'd left the door open but shut the light off. And as he turned the corner, he realized that the light was off. 
And so he stopped. And I was a little bit behind him from about me to Brother Tracy, and I said, it's all right, buddy, keep going. He didn't even look back, but he kept going. And so in us, when we have those moments where we're doubting, where we're struggling, where we're feeling discouraged, it's God's voice that we've got to listen to in those moments, our Father's voice that we've got to listen to in those moments. Say, keep going, buddy, I'm right behind you. So God has us. So when we're feeling discouraged, we pray and we persevere. The passage continues. They, they feel more attacks. Uh, verse 7, it says, When Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabs and Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to, and to cause confusion in it. All right? And so they get another attack. And so this time, more are coming. And so it says that they're coming to cause confusion. All right, which is a weird thing. If you're going to fight in a battle, right, confusion is not like something you're looking to do. I, uh, for maybe the second time in my life last night, uh, watched some of the, the UFC fights going on. All right, I miss sports so much. Well, I've watched NASCAR, UFC, and so um, watched some of the UFC fights going on. So these two guys are in this ring and they're fighting. Let me tell you what they're not doing. They're not throwing riddles at each other, trying to confuse each other, right? They're not like, hey, what gets wetter as it dries? They're not doing that, right? They're actually fighting, and so it's weird to hear confusion, but the thing is, Sambala and all these other leaders, they were under the same rule of Persia uh, that Nehemiah was, and so they couldn't physically attack them, so what they do to begin to uh, get after them is they begin to dishearten them and try to confuse them. And they begin to fight with confusion, that they're picking on them becomes plotting against them. And they begin to make them question, begin to make them doubt. And we will face this same kind of thing. That the more we resist, the more we keep pressing forward, the more opposition we're going to face. And we're going to hear things like, give up. Quit going. And we're trying to take away our will to fight. We'll hear things like, you can't fight this. Your dad had a drinking problem, you will too. Your mom struggled with depression, you will too. It's in your DNA, it's who you are. And so we will begin to hear those thoughts try to come in, try to confuse us, try to stop us. What do we do when those moments come, when we keep pressing forward, but we keep uh, hearing that? I love how Nehemiah responds. Let's go to verse 13 and 14. Let's skip down to verse 13 and 14 real quick. It says, so in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bow. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sisters, your sons, your wives, and your homes. That at this time, all the believers were spread out building this wall. And so what Nehemiah does is he gathers them together and he arms them. And he gives them perspective. And so that's the second thing. We, 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 we pray and we get perspective. All right? That they were spread out and he brings them together, remind them of a simple truth is that you're not alone. You're not alone. One of the most comforting times as a believer. That's why this, this, when we were shut down, it was just so difficult on so many levels. Because when we walk into this building and gather together, it should be a big, giant reminder that we are not alone, that we are in this fight together. And it should be one of the most comforting feelings that we feel throughout the week, is to be gathered together, to realize that we're not alone. We're in this fight together. And so Nehemiah gives them perspective. I don't know if you caught that. He gathers them together, reminds them that they're not alone and he says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Those words in the Greek right there mean great and awesome, all right? And so, remember the Lord who is great and awesome is with you. And not only that, real quick, he reminds them who they're fighting for in this. He says, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. 
I don't have um, many just amazing memories of my sports career, right? Um, but one that I do have was my, my senior year in football. Um, we were playing uh, China Spring at home. And I don't know if y'all know who uh, Coach Harris is, Kim Harris. Um, he was one of our coaches at the time. And we were getting ready to play that Friday night, and that Thursday he got a call that his dad was not doing well and probably wouldn't make it through the weekend. And so Coach Harris went to see his dad on, this, on a Thursday, and he came back on Friday night to coach us. And we were playing China Spring, and I vividly just remember this game. We were down 14 to nothing at halftime. We hadn't done anything the whole game. And so we're in the locker room. We're all angry. Coach Harris walks in. If you've never heard Coach Harris shout, dude's got some volume. And so Coach Harris walks in, and he begins to give us this speech that I wish that somebody had recorded. I mean, he just laid into us. Said that I'm around, he said things <laughs> like, I'm around a bunch of quitters who won't fight when my daddy is fighting for every breath, and I should be there by his side. It riled us up. He ended by just screaming fight at us several times in a row and walked out. We came back in that second half and we were renewed. We ended up winning the game 22-14. to 14. I don't know if China Spring gained another yard that second half. Because everything changed in that game when we realized who we were fighting for. That second half we were fighting for Coach Harris. And we knew it. Really cool. We all signed the game ball afterwards, gave it with him. His dad passed away the next day, and his, that ball was actually buried with his dad, one of my favorite just sports things I was ever a part of. But everything changed when we realized who we were fighting for. Nehemiah reminds them, hey, God is fighting for you. Remember who you are fighting for. He says, remember your children. Listen, we just witnessed... Great, great migration of like 30 kids, right, walking out of here. Beautiful sight to see. We've got teenagers here. I'll tell you, adults, if you're thinking I don't have anybody to fight for, you have this younger generation to fight for. They desperately need to see older believers who are passionately in love with Jesus Christ and passionately fighting. When those moments come of just struggle for me, I think of Bishop and I think of our boy that's coming. I mean, that's just that's who I'm fighting for. I can't fall because of them. I think of the youth group. I think of this church. There's so much that we have to fight for. Nehemiah gathers in together. You're not alone. God is fighting for you. Remember who you are fighting for. And so we get perspective in the midst of a battle. That we realize that God is fighting for us and we have so much to fight for. He gets on, just real quick, let's, let's cover this last part of this. Verse 15. So when our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had frustrated their plans, and we returned to the wall, each of his work, from that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, half held the spears, shields, and bows, and uh, coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole houses of Judah, who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each one labored on the work with one hand uh, and held his weapon with the other. Each one of the builders held his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me, and I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall far from another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came up. And I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night with Jerusalem that there may be a guard for us by day and may labor by night. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes, each kept his weapon in his right hand. Now real quick, we pray, we get perspective, we pray and we persevere, and lastly, we pray and we get practical, that we figure out practical ways to fight. He said that every believer in this moment 
was building with one hand and had a sword in the other, they were ready to go, that they armed themselves in these moments. That I'm building and I'm battling. And it says that they're, they're going, they shored up the breaches in the wall. We talked about the breaches where, where the battle was coming from, right? Each of us know, and we should. Well, I've, I tell the students all the time, one of the greatest things that you can do as a Christian is know your own weaknesses. And know where your breach is. Know where Satan's going to try to attack you. It's to be a student of yourself. Know where that breach is and know that you have to shore up that spot. Know where that battle is going to come from. That we pray and we get practical and we figure out ways to fight. Christian, hear me. Don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to fail. I recently, for 100 days, I followed the keto diet, one of the longest 100-day period of my entire life. But as I was following this diet, I did not walk into the donut shop. Because if I do, I'm downing them. I can't. I'm not going to stop myself. Christians, hear me. Don't put yourself in situations where you're going to fail. I talk to young men all the time who are struggling with lust. Statistics say that 91% of, of, um, of young men between the ages of 12 and 18 in the last month have been exposed to internet pornography. You want to talk a, about a younger generation that needs examples? It's this one right now. And I counsel young men all the time who are fighting with this. They're saying, I want to stop. And I ask them, where, where, do, you, where do you fail? In my room late at night. What do you fail on? My phone. Where's your phone? In my room late at night. Get your phone out of your room. Don't put yourself in situations where you're going to fail. Be a student of yourself. Get practical and fight. Don't leave yourself unguarded. Know your situation. Know how you fail. Know how you struggle. And be prepared to fight. I'd love, love to tell you, follow these three steps, that you get perseverance, you get perspective, and you get practical, the battle's over. I'd love to tell you that, but that's not the case. <laughs> Yay, right? Good, great news. You know when the battle stops for you? The day you go home. Until then, you're fighting. But let me, that's not very hopeful, but let me give you some hope. The enemy who you're fighting against, his future's already been written. 2010 is just a great number to arm yourself with. Because Revelations 20.10 says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. Your enemy's future has been written. And if you're in Christ, here's the great news. Yours has too. Second Timothy, me and Adam right now are going through uh, the Timothys together. In 2 Timothy, you get Paul's last words, right? He's writing to Timothy. He knows that he's about to check out, right? Verse 6. He says, For I am being poured out as a drink offering, and the time has come of my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Here's your future. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but to also those who have loved his appearing. As a believer, your future has been written. Let me say this. If you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, let me give you some great news. We talked about closing the breaches that we have in our life. The greatest news I can give you is that Jesus has closed the ultimate breach is that the chasm between you and God was, was there because of your sin. There was nothing you could possibly do to get back to God. No way that you can earn it, nothing that you deserve to get back to God. But God, in his great love for you, sent his son Jesus to live the life you couldn't live, die the death that you deserve, rise again victorious over sin, heth, sin, death, hell, and the grave on the third day, so that all who put their faith and their trust in him will not perish, but they will have eternal life. 
There is forgiveness. There is life for you found in Jesus Christ. So listen, I don't know where you're at today. If you feel like you're being attacked and attacked and attacked, as you get closer and closer to God. I had a student tell me uh, recently that he, he, you know, I just, he said that it seems like since I got closer to God, my life has gotten worse. I said, welcome to the war. I said, you didn't join no fan club, you enlisted. Maybe you're being attacked as you're getting closer and closer and closer to God. Persevere. Get your perspective. Know who you're fighting for. Know who's fighting for you. And get practical about how you're going to fight. If you're here and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you know, there's a God out there who loves you more than you can possibly imagine and wants to radically alter your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for all the ways that you love us, all the ways that you bless us. Lord, Father, I pray that we would be ready for the fight, Lord, that we would be ready for battle, that we could, at the end of our days, that we could say, like Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Father, I pray for all of us in here, that we would just steadily, no matter our circumstances, we wouldn't be defined by our circumstances, but we would be defined by you, and we would pursue you each and every day, that we would get closer and closer and closer. And as those attacks come, that we would persevere, that we would get perspective in the midst of the battle, and that we would get practical about how we fight. Father, I pray for anybody in here that does not know you, Lord, that you would draw them in today, that you would draw them near, and they would recognize your great love for them and what you have done. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we sing.